Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Only a few years ago, it seemed that the fight for gay rights was won in the UK. Illegal equality was achieved, prejudice rapidly dying out, mission accomplished. Well, unfortunately not, according to Gareth Roberts, whose new book, Gay Shame, The Rise of Gender Ideology and the New Homophobia, argues that gender ideology is homophobic and has captured institutions like Stonewall and the gay press. And I'm delighted to say that Gareth joins me now. Welcome to the show. Hi, Andrew. And congratulations on the book. It's absolutely fantastic, as I knew it would be, because you're a brilliant writer. Can you tell us a bit about this? A lot of people watching will think, what on earth are you talking about? We've won gay rights. How can it be the case that homophobia is making a comeback? What would you say to that? Yeah, it's, it's hard to understand for people because um, it sounds counterintuitive, you know. How can gay people be homophobic? What's going on? It, it doesn't make sense to them. But I think what's happened is... Um, with the coming of what I call genderism, gender ideology, um, it's kind of revived homophobia in a completely new guise. So, um, and nobody quite understood what was going on. I certainly didn't for quite a while. And suddenly it just became apparent that, you know, this was an ideology that was saying um, there's something wrong with camp little boys and tomboy little girls and they need fixing. And, you know, that's crazy. You know, that, if that isn't homophobia, what is? And one of the really interesting things that you, you point out in the book, uh, on many, uh, in many of the chapters, is that a lot of this is being driven by gay people. The idea that all of a sudden, uh, g lesbians should be shamed for not including people with penises in their dating pool. Uh, yeah. you know, and th th a lot of this is coming from a lot of particularly gay male celebrities. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, yes. I think they're all just terrified. Um, I think particularly in the, the media world, which is kind of where I come from, you know, the TV cultural world, um, there's a kind of blanket um, take-up of genderism, of gender ideology, and it's become um, so unquestioned, and it happens so rapidly, that people feel um, they have to go along with it. They don't even think about it. They just kind of take it as an, a, one of the new progressive opinions that they just grab off the shelf. Yes. And, um, and what's happened is um, those people, you know, because they think it's what the good person does, they just enforce it. And quite, um, quite um, forcefully at times. Well, one of the things that you point out in the book, which I think is really interesting, is, is it, uh, the comparisons that are often made to Section 28. People will mm. say that, you know, if you're, if you're not being, uh, being pro-trans identity, pro-non-binary, or pro-LGBTQIA+, you're effectively enforcing the equivalent of, of Section 28. But that's mm. a, a poor comparison, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very poor comparison. The two things don't really align at all. I think it's just a very handy thing that people sort of grab off the shelf to say. Often it's very young people that have no memory of Section 28. And as I say in the book, you know, the situation then was completely different in this country. We forget what Section 28 was about and how it came about. Um, a lot of that was due to quite crazy behaviour of um, gay activists. Um, now... Section 28 was a bad thing and it should not have happened and the government shouldn't have done it and it was bad legislation. But at the same time, um, it's not as bad as, as genderism. Yeah. You know, Section 28 wasn't doing half the things that genderism is doing. Well, well that's, a, that's a very important point, isn't it? Because you didn't have people in authority suggesting to young gay people that they were in the yeah. wrong body and needed to be surgically corrected, which, as exactly, you say, yeah. just sounds incredibly... That's the, yeah. the very definition of homophobia, surely. I mean, when, when this first started happening, I thought, well, somebody's going to say something. Because, you know, somebody usually does. <laughs> you know, when things happen, you know, bad things happen, somebody steps in, and this time they just didn't. And yes. I kept waiting. I'm, you know, I'm still looking at my watch. And, we, you know, we've just had a four-year public inquiry, which has taken four years to tell us that telling kids they can change their sex is bad. You know, yes. I mean, good, fine, thanks, Dr. Cass. But, you know, did it really take, we really need four years? And it's all happened so quickly. I mean, I know you and you make the analogy of, 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 of when you're walking every day past a building being constructed and you just get used to the scaffolding and the rest. And then one day it's suddenly there towering over you. It did yeah. seem to come out of nowhere, didn't it? I mean, wh why do you think it took hold of the, L of the gay community so quickly? I think what it was was around the time 2012, 2013, when um, gay marriage was legalised in this country, a lot of the Western world um, gay rights had sort of been won. 
And what you had was big organizations like Stonewall, the LGBT plus consortium, whatever. And suddenly, you know, they had huge staffs, big machinery, lots of campaigning stuff going on and no campaigns to fight, at least on their own ground. Um, and trans was coming along at the same time and gender was coming along and saying, we want to be a part of you. Now, Stonewall with, under Ruth Hunt took that decision in 2014, 15, and immediately that changed everything really quickly. Um, I say in the book how once I remember writing the, the initials LGB in a tweet or something, and I thought, oh, well, I better add T, just because everyone else is. And I thought, well, hold on, I, I haven't thought about that. Nobody's asked me, nobody's discussed it. It's just suddenly there, and is this right? And I didn't know half of what I know now, but still at the same time, I was thinking, there's something very odd about this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it sort of happened gradually, but also the actual turning point in 2014, which I think is when you can narrow it down to, seemed to take about two weeks. Mm. You know, it was like, suddenly it was like, oh, we, we've got the transgender, the T and the Q and the plus with us now. And uh, okay. Um, and it happened before anyone could react. But, but it's also, it, it, it seems quite counterintuitive if you stop and think about it for a moment, because a lot of the people who identify as Q, as, as queer, are just straight people with a kink, aren't they, as far as I can see? Yeah. Uh, or yeah, asexuals, I'm... people who've never been oppressed. You yeah. know, no one's been oppressed yeah. for having a low libido, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So, so why is it that they were able to attach themselves, limpet-like, uh, to, to people who have actually faced oppression? I think they wanted a bit of the oppression pie, and as we know, you know, that's what people, that's what brings you status now. You know, if you're a sort of middle-class spod from, you know, somewhere, um, and you haven't got any oppression status, well, you know, dye your hair purple and call yourself queer. Great, <laughs> come on in, you know. Queer energy, queer joy, you know, sort of. Sorry. I mean, no, that's, that's, I understand your frustration there. But one of the things you also go into is uh, what the gay community uh, used to be like. And there is a sense in which uh, th yeah. there's been a loss of sense of humour uh, among yeah. that community now. I mean, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Well, I mean, a very good example. Today I saw um, a tweet, a little video by the comedian Scott Caputo, who I know you've had on the show, I think. Um, and he was saying how, I think he was in, he was doing a show and the Islington police said he was homophobic. And this is Scott Capuro, you know, who's like a truth-telling, very naughty, very push the boundaries, gay comedian, you know, one of the first, probably the first very openly gay stand-up that was ever around. Yes. Um, and it, and it, sort of, it sort of percolated across that whole scene that, you know, suddenly everyone was sort of robotically repeating the mantras, you know, love is love, transgender women are women and all that sort of thing. Um, and the, the sort of the questioning aspect, the sort of, hey, hang on, just vanished. Yes, and I think one of the great things about your book is it's, it's really funny. I mean, that's the f first and foremost, it's a really great read, and I'd love people to read it because it reminds us of a kind of a, a, a dare I say, a kind of waspishness, a kind of, a kind of subversive quality that the gay community yeah. used to have. And you mentioned the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, which used, I've seen some of the most subversive performances there, but then a few yeah. years ago, they put a sign up uh, saying which things comedians shouldn't joke about. So yeah. isn't yeah. that a good yeah. example of what's going on here? Oh, yeah, completely. I, th I think I was... Um Somebody in the audience once wrote into the Vauxhall Town and said, I should decide what you show and what people should say. And they went, yeah, great. Yeah. I remember looking on their Facebook page and it was them saying, we've got this person in now that can tell us exactly where we've been going wrong. And I was like, what are you talking about? This is the Vauxhall Tavern. Yeah. You know, come on. It's that idea that suddenly the most subversive in, in society have all become conformists overnight. It's very depressing. Yeah. But one of the things you do, uh, to, if I, do, I hope it's not a spoiler, uh, Gareth, but towards the end of the book, you do offer two potential futures, two paths yeah. that we might go down. Uh, do you want to tell yeah. us what, what you mean by that? Well, one future is the one which hopefully with Dr. Cass um, and all that's happened recently, um, with Kemi Bader not making sort of approving noises about maybe a statutory public inquiry into gender, is the fact that we'll sort of come to our senses. But there have been so many times over the past few years where I've thought, well, this is it now. You know, when J.K. Rowling first came out and said something, when Maya Force started on her case, but I thought, well, that's it, that's it now. That's the end of gender. And it's just rolled on, you know, like a steamroller. Nothing's really changed. The second future is where it just triumphs, like it has in Canada. And you've got like, you know, where it's, where it's virtually illegal 
to say anything um, against genderism. So I think we have that that possibility of going down one of one of those two parts. And as you say, it's very bad news for gay rights if we do go down the path of genderism because it is it is directly in conflict, isn't it? So do you think that hopefully that that second future won't happen, that actually we will end up in a world where people understand that gay rights needs to be secured on the basis that there is such a thing as biological sex? That's the whole point. Well, you'd hope so, yeah. I mean, I I'm, I'm really hope so. I mean, seeing people like Wes Streetie and Shabana Mahmood, I mean, you know, on, one, on the one hand, you're thinking... Well, thank you. Where were you? But at the same time, it's great, you know, that these people can feel they can say this stuff, particularly as we're probably about to have a Labour government. Yes. Um, and on, on that, Gareth, just very finally, yeah. you know, you do make the point that we do need to build a golden bridge. It's very frustrating for yeah. those of us who've been sounding this alarm for many years to see a lot yeah. of people suddenly say, oh, yeah, actually, they're right. They're, there is a problem. But actually, this isn't about ego. We have to bring those people along, don't we? Yeah, we have to just, you know, it sticks in the craw and, you know, um, you want to scream, but at the same time, you have to go, great, thank you. Just as people did with gay rights mm. and in the original days of Stonewall, you know, when suddenly people like Edwina Curry were fighting for gay rights. It was actually, you had to say, great, thank you, Edwina, thank you. you know, and that's what you've got to do now. Well, uh, I think your book will be a, a big part of waking people up to the problem. It's called Gay thank Shame. I hope people buy it. It's fantastic. Gareth Roberts, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Andrew. Cool.